If there's one thing our Lord won't let us do, it's get complacent about our discipleship. Our Lord is not satisfied with good enough disciples. Our Lord is not satisfied with good enough disciples, especially when we dare to presume that we set the standard for what good enough is. He is continually reminding us, as he does in the gospel today, that we are not members of a social club, a religious discussion group, or a social justice organization. We are disciples of Christ saints in the making, members of the church our Lord himself founded. But even more than that, he wants us to know we are lovers. Isn't that what Jesus said? Anyone who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Yes, we are lovers. Let's think about that for a minute, for it's significant. There were a lot of rabbis in Jesus' day, and at the time they all had disciples. And while many, I'm sure, were loved by their disciples, none, I suspect, made loving them a condition of discipleship. Certainly none required a greater love for them than the one's parents. Now, in the Ten Commandments, honoring our father and mother is second only to honoring God. That is, the only one we're to love more than our parents is God himself. Yet, Jesus calls us to love him more than our parents. The conclusion that follows from these premises would not have been lost on the disciples and should not be lost on us either. To be a disciple of our Lord is to commit to a radical, life-changing reordering of priorities. Priorities that are ordered according to God's divine law. Priorities that reflect how all of reality actually works. Reality both visible and invisible. Material and spiritual. Temporal and eternal. This divine law flows from a single source and has a single principle, that source being God, that principle being love. Only lovers, then, can get into the flow, if you will, can tap directly into the source, as it were. We see this divine law of love in operation in the readings today, but it doesn't seem to work the way we might expect. In the first reading, we find an example of a prophet's reward that our Lord was talking about in the gospel. The woman and her husband who showed Elisha such generous hospitality received a son as their reward. Elisha, according to the gifts God bestowed on him, miraculously gave them what their hearts desired. So too, we may presume, from a righteous man, we would receive justice and integrity as a reward. But we reach the surprising part of the divine law when we, for love of God, do the least little thing for the least among us. Surprising because it seems that however small the thing we do, a cup of water for a little one, as long as we do it with great love, the reward we receive is an eternal one. And this reward comes not from the prophet, not from the righteous man, not from the little one, but from God himself. Father Marie Yushen, a Carmelite friar, commented on this. This divine law, he wrote, surprises us because it goes so much against our experience of the natural laws of the world. But the divine law of love does not contradict the natural laws of the world. It completes them. To love our parents as God intended, we must love God even more than we love them. 
to love our children as God intended, we must love God even more than we love them. To find eternal life, we must lose our lives for his sake. To be a disciple of Christ, we must take up our cross daily and follow him. We must let love of God overcome our fear of the cross. But this brings us full circle, doesn't it? How do we love that way? How do we become lovers, disciples of Christ, that we are called to be? We start small and we stay small. We start small and we stay small. We start small by doing little things with great love. We stay small by admitting that we are incapable of doing even that without God's help and that we will be that way our entire lives. We will always need God's help to do that. This probably sounds familiar because it's essentially the little way of St. Therese of Lisieux, a Carmelite nun and doctor of the church. In fact, Emmanuel has a special connection with St. Therese as our church was completed the same year Therese was born in 1873. The statue in the back of the church near the Pieta is of St. Therese. St. Therese, like most of us, had grandiose ideas about how she might serve God. Though in a convent, she wanted to be a missionary in exotic foreign lands and convert pagans to Christ. But she was also aware that due to her fragile health, she wouldn't be able to do that. Furthermore, she was filled with imperfections. She was willful and had a terrible temper, for instance. But rather than relying on her own strength and thereby becoming a good enough disciple, she decided to start small and stay small. She started small by deciding to do little things with great love. She stayed small by admitting that her own strength and abilities were no more than that of a child. And she relied on God to supply what she lacked. It is impossible for me, she wrote, to grow up. So I must bear with myself such as I am with all my imperfections. But I want to seek out a means of going to heaven by a little way, a way that is very straight, very short, and totally new. Knowing that she couldn't possibly navigate what she called the stairway of perfection, she continued, I wanted to find an elevator which would raise me to Jesus for I am too small to climb the rough stairway of perfection. I searched then in the scriptures for some sign of this elevator, the object of my desires. And then I read these words, whoever is a little one, let him come to me. The elevator then which must raise me to heaven is your arms, O Jesus. And for this I have no need to grow up but rather have to remain little and become this more and more. There was an older nun in the community that, according to Therese, annoyed her in all that she did. She was a constant thorn in her side merely by her mannerisms. We can sympathize with this, can we not? For we've all probably experienced this in our own family. But rather than yielding to bad temper and dealing harshly with her, she decided to put it, uh, to, she decided to rather, as she put it, do for this sister all that I should do for the one I love the most. Every time I met her, I prayed for her and offered to God her virtues and merits. But I was not satisfied with merely praying for her, she continued, since she gave me so many opportunities for self-mastery. I tried to render her as many services as I could, and when tempted to answer her sharply, I made haste to smile and change the subject. Or, if the temptation was very severe, 
I would run like a deserter from the battlefield if I could do so without letting this sister guess my inward struggle. One day this sister said to me with a beaming face, My dear Therese, tell me what attraction you find in me, for whenever we meet you greet me with such a sweet smile. What attracted me, she wrote, was Jesus hidden in the depths of her soul. Jesus, who makes sweet even that which is most bitter. St. Therese stayed small. She contracted tuberculosis at the age of 24, and as she lay dying, she overheard two nuns wondering what in the world Mother Superior could possibly say about her in her obituary, since she had done nothing extraordinary. Hadn't she, though? By doing little things with great love, she had become a saint. To be worthy of our Lord, to truly be his disciples, we must order our lives according to the divine law of love. We don't do that through our own efforts or strength. We do that by becoming lovers by starting small and staying small, doing little things with great love and leaving the rest to God.